if you have any if you have any colleagues who would like to view this or you would like to watch it again um, or any other um, person who wasn't able to attend tonight would have that um, recording available. Great. So as we said, for a lot of people, uh, we have had people just join the idea capture tool. I will put that in the chat. One more time. So there's that top link presentation link is the presentation to the slides you're looking at. And then the idea capture tool. And, you know, no surprises here. What's a goal you have for student talk? What's the success you've had? That's, you know, always a great thing to uh, share. And then, you know, what's a barrier? And, uh, yep. And after you finish with that, we will give a little bit about 60 or 90 seconds. And I think Bradford, we were welcoming that if you do finish your own reflection that you kind of look through what other teachers are writing in the capture tool to see if you are having similar experiences as other teachers, because really we're trying to form a community here of teachers helping teachers that we, Bradford and I understand that we do not hold all the knowledge on this and we really want us to be able to learn from each other. And just as we write, I saw someone who, uh, yeah, someone saying that uh, the person who talks is the person who learns. Yep, my first principal always said that too. So if you're doing the talking, you're doing the learning. If the students are doing the talking, yeah. And then, you know, one thing I wanted to say, and I didn't know exactly where to say it, you know, there's, there's no, you know, to calibrate, this is tough work. And obviously we've all worked at it and it is hard to get students to talk, you know, and, and these last couple of years have been harder, have presented even new challenges. So just want to own that and, and say, you know, that we will talk about strategies and I got I got more to say, but I'm going to save it for the for the slides. All right, so about just 30 more seconds to finish up or scroll around and read. These are pretty interesting. Uh, we do got a pretty packed schedule though, so 30 more seconds. I I did see in the chat Molly sent me a direct message that she's having trouble. Is anyone else having trouble? Um, if you are, send me your email and I will directly share the, um, the idea capture tool with you. We did change the permissions on that and it should work. You might have to refresh, but if you're still having trouble, just um, direct message me and I will just put your name directly in um, into the document. And then try refreshing because yeah. if you did load it before we changed the permission, it will still have that trouble. Good, thanks. It's working for Molly, so great. <laughs> great, so as I was alluding to, uh, you know, this, yeah, it's awesome. And uh, yeah, 47 people here working on, you know, coming together because student talk is so important. So obviously the big goals for this one is, you know, thinking and discussing student discourse supports and, you know, that big aim, equity in the classroom. Practice some talk moves that you can use and especially come back next week. We really wanted this one to be a two session webinar. So you have a chance to go try something, come back and reflect with colleagues, you know, really a professional learning community, right? PLC. Practice the talk moves with your peers here. So that's Susan mentioned it, really do hope that you are willing to play that student hat role and practice a couple. And just like students, right? Like you see protocols and sometimes they're, they, you know, we're not used to using them. Students aren't used to using them. So they feel a little artificial and we want to embrace that and, and, uh, get comfortable with that and encourage our students to get comfortable because those top sentence stems and sentence frames and protocols can be helpful. It would be great to move away from them with successful talk, but most people, including myself, 
have to start the year with a lot of these. So just want to put that out there and hope that uh, people feel uh, comfortable with doing that. And then reflection and talking to each other. That is something amazing about this grant that we have is as teachers should be paid to come together and work on their craft. And here's a chance for us to do that. Susan, do you want to add anything before we go on? Yeah, I, I think I just uh, just a little bit that that idea that that sometimes those protocols with sentence frames can feel a little awkward and they will it, when you try them, but it really provides a lot of comfort for students who may like give you the impression that it's awkward, but it really helps students understand how to talk academically with each other and it keeps them on task and on point. And, um, and it, like exactly like Bradford said, moving away from them as students internalize them um, throughout the year. So as you go on the, through the year, the, the hope is that if you're using these type of protocols, students understand that we want them to share what they think, we want them to support what they're thinking and saying with evidence, and that we want them to listen to others and respond to them with appropriate questions and asking them to also support their arguments with evidence. And that is really the goal for all of these talk protocols is talking and sharing ideas with evidence and listening to the ideas of others. So that's what this is how you can get started. And when we did this last year, teachers like said, oh yeah, I didn't know how it was going to work. But I tried it, you know, because you asked me to, and they came back and said, I can't believe it, it worked. So we're mm -hmm. just saying, trust us at this point. It, it will help, hopefully. So we're going to be sharing um, these protocols today, and we're hoping we can get through all of them. And if not, those that we don't get through today, we will do in part two on November 15th. So they won't go away. We'll, we, um, we're, we're hopeful that we can get through them, but if not, um, we will get through them next time. Okay. And then, yeah, d d yeah, Susan, do you wanna do this one? One other thing to say that, we didn't mention, we have everyone from physics, chemistry, and biology all here together, which is pretty powerful and it's nice. And one success out of that might be if you're able to collaborate with your colleagues at your school, especially if you're teaching chemistry and biology, it's nice to utilize some of the protocols that they're already familiar with. But sometimes you got to mix things up just to keep it fresh. So not saying that, you know, just because a colleague did it previously, you might need to, to mix it up to keep it fresh. Uh, Susan, did we want to uh, go through and have people give the thumbs up on each of those if they've been trying them here? Did... Um, I think this was just, um, you know, after we had the initial reflection uh, we were just going to ask people to, to do like a waterfall in the chat of like either what's working or what's not working in their classroom. So it was just kind of a quick, um, a quick sharing um, to out to everybody. I don't know if that's, is that's what you were thinking, but that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Great. So yeah, let's anyone uh, are, you know, the thing that we discussed was trying to build some momentum, right? Like, in one sense, probably everyone's tried think, pair, share, and maybe you haven't for a while. It, you know, for a while it was like all the time and, and then kind of got overplayed. So we went away from it. But anyone here want to talk about what's working? Have you tried some of these lately? And just to get that sort of feedback from each other. So if people are willing to, we'll give a little like 30 seconds. If you'd put one of those that you've tried that was working for you, just to see if some things pop up enough that might be like, oh yeah, maybe I should try that again, is the goal we're thinking here. So if you, and of course multiple is a good one, but just to get a little feedback. Thanks Sonia for putting that in the chat. Great, great Megan. Yeah, so if you're yep, willing to hit that, yeah. 
Talk Moose has worked, yay. Good. We're glad that there's some expertise in the room and people are sharing things. <clears throat> yeah. Nice. Yeah. And then also, what maybe is something that seems like it works or you really want it to be working, but it's presenting a barrier? All right, so we're going to dive into these. So just want to sort of prime people's thinking and, and you know, if you were skeptical on one of these and you saw it pop up as a uh, as one, that might just be, yeah, just a motivation to try it out again. All right, so. Uh, yeah, AB with normal desks is difficult. I see that if you have, I you know, so Bradford does have some, um, suggestions for that we will talk about. So seating issues is always uh, a problem and a barrier for um, this course. Totally. Yes. And we're going to take these on each thing. So we do have some things prepared for each of those. So the one piece just to put out in front, and this is stuff you already know, but uh, I call it priming. Like we want to put the things in the front of our head and no surprise here. So I almost don't want to read them, but you know, just let yourself, even though they're not great examples, they're not the perfect example, but yeah, compare and contrast string theory and quantum mechanics. Uh, I don't know what to say, right? And so we, that might, you know, what are the challenges from the student perspective? They don't know what to say. And so often, even if it's on something that you might say they know, how often does a student think they don't know it? or like they have unrealistic expectations of what it means to be at the level we want them to be, especially so often we talk about exposure, practice, mastery. Students in the exposure phase have a self expectation of the mastery phase. I'm so confused, even though they know the key points that we actually want them to know uh, for that stage of the learning. All right, and then like, I'm just oh, yeah. going to add on to that. I think that's why it's so important that students have common experiences, that they're talking about things that they have done and personally experienced in the classroom, as opposed to the more kind of esoteric things. So if we really concentrate our discourse uh, energies on the labs and activities that they have done and completed and have knowledge to talk about, we're going to get greater success. Yeah, excellent. And then, you know, just how would you explain electoral college to a five-year-old? And even, you know, that we were trying to prime you with just like, oh, you know, the electoral college, but where would you start? And that can be a deal breaker. And uh, multiple people read it. I already mentioned it the one time, you know, with AB sharing, I think one of the best things about AB sharing is it says who should start talking first, right? Just that even if you have a group of four students that are willing to talk, sometimes if you give them two minutes to talk, you might lose 30 seconds, a minute to them deciding who should talk first. And, you know, they play the nose game and then they're like, no, you got to redo it. And we need, you know, to be more efficient. We need students to be more efficient with that talk time. So in any case, just have that primed. Like how big of, sometimes even if someone's willing to say it, it can hold them up of knowing how to start. And of course, sentence frames, sentence stems are great for that. All right, and then describe a humiliating experience that still causes you embarrassment. Like think about it, if you can genuinely think like, you would probably not share that right now. And, you know, uh, talking in class can be, almost that level of an experience for so many students, right? If that's coming off the pandemic, any talking in front of the class could be high stakes. And so just let's have that prime. So it, we have that in the back of our minds as we start to look at the structures of these talk moves. And then I'll hand it over to Susan. I was gonna say, in keeping that talk academically focused, right? Not. Uh, we want students to be able to feel comfortable to bring in 
their personal and home experience, but we have to be aware that we have to be sensitive to the kinds of things we're asking them to share. So part of the reason we want students to engage in discourse is equity. And there is a STEM teaching tool brief. And if you're not familiar with STEM teaching tools, um, that is a great um, place to go to find resources to support instruction. Um, and yeah, we, we put the link in the chat there for you. But in we know that when students are really learning and, and if they need to make sense of their ideas, we need to have them talking. And, and it's, it's easy to think like when you're listening to someone else doing the talking and say, yeah, I get that, I get that. But then when you are asked to explain it to somebody else, I mean, I know even in professional development when I'm asked to do that, I'm like, oh, you know, what? I don't know, I get all nervous. So, um, we, we, we know that we don't, we, we know that by talking about something, we actually learn about it even more. So we want that. We want kids to learn how to articulate their ideas. This is a great skill for their future. It is um, something that, that that's, could be for their lifelong benefit. And, um, and we also need to know um, what, what do students know and what do they not know and what do they not understand? And it's so much easier to do this through discourse than it is to do this through a ticket out the door that you're not collecting until the end of the period. We need to be doing ongoing formative assessment by listening to students talking to each other. Uh, other reasons, um, it broadens participation. Um, it supports language learning, which I think for all of us is important. We have a large number of emerging bilinguals in our classroom, but not only emerging bilinguals are learning language. All students need to be learning academic language and academic speaking. And this is something that's fundamental to the NGSS. Uh, talk can be culturally responsive. So when appropriate, we can um, have students sharing their home experience. And we know that there are different norms that are uh, in different um, home environments that have different expectations for talk, which is why providing protocols helps us provide a safe place for sharing and refining ideas. We want to honor those facets of knowledge that students bring from their family and their cultural, cultural experiences and, and having a, a classroom where students are comfortable in talking with each other and you're building relationship, you're building community, and that makes learning easier for many students. Um, and students can often explain something to other students in ways that maybe the teacher is not getting through and we want that to happen. We want there to be more than one teacher in the room that students can actually teach and learn from each other. So there's four goals for productive discussions, and this is from the inquiry project where the um, talk moves that we're going to share next comes from. So these goals are from that. Um, so it's helping students, uh, individual students share, expand and clarify their own thinking, helping students listening carefully to one another. And this listening is, is hugely important because um, active listening and being able to repeat or re-say what another student has said can be just as an important piece as presenting a new idea. And this is especially useful for uh, merging bilinguals who are learning the language if we help them and, and ask them to re-state um, what another student has said um, because they have already heard that and it helps um, it helps them move forward. Uh, it helps students deepening, helping students deepening their reasoning and helping students think with others. Those are the four goals. And there will be protocols for each one of these goals that we're going to share. We're gonna watch a video here. It's a short five minute video on, um, on Talk Moves Overview, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. 
Many teachers find it challenging to hold classroom discussions that are academically productive. All too often we find ourselves going back to the traditional form of teaching, recitation. The teacher asks a question and students attempt to provide the right answer. There's no discussion and not much talk about the reasoning that led to the answer. Teachers who are able to orchestrate productive discussions consistently are usually skilled at getting four different things to happen. First, they are able to help all the students to share, expand, and clarify their reasoning out loud to the whole group. If only a few students share their reasoning, you don't have a discussion. You have a monologue, or at best, a dialogue. Second, they are able to help students learn to listen carefully to one another. They support students' efforts to really understand what their classmates are saying. Third, these teachers are able to get students to dig deeper into their reasoning. They don't let students stop with superficial answers. They keep the focus on deepening the thinking, with data or evidence, around core scientific concepts. And fourth, these teachers are able to get students to think with others, to really work with the ideas of their classmates. Their students don't stop with just giving their own ideas. They consider and take up the thoughts and ideas of others. None of these four steps are easy. There can be many different challenges. Some students don't feel comfortable sharing their thinking at first. They may not be used to listening carefully to what other students say. There is often a lack of clarity in what students say and think. But these teachers have found ways to make it happen consistently, and their students benefit from this productive talk. Over time, by participating in discussions, their students become more powerful reasoners. They get better at explaining their ideas, and they become better science learners. So how do these teachers manage to create productive discussions? Researchers have found that teachers who are skillful at this draw on a toolkit of strategies. Collectively, we refer to these strategies as productive talk moves. They are simple questions and statements that help students to participate in the four steps we just described. Some talk moves help students share, expand, and clarify their reasoning. These are moves such as the say more move, Revoicing. So, let me see if I've got your thinking right. Are you saying that? And wait time. Julia? Like things that belong to the earth and like the nature around us. And what do you mean that they belong to the earth? Can you kind of explain that a little bit more? When, they, when, when I said they belong to the earth, Okay, well what I heard Kyla say was actually a little bit different than what I heard Alicia say. So, Kyla, you're saying that if I have three cups, I need to put the same volume in each cup? And Alicia, if I listen to you correctly, were you saying that you need to pour different amounts into the cups? No, like you have three different cups and you put, put A in one cup, put B in a different cup, and you see in the cup and see if they have the same. In the clip you just watched, the teacher didn't simply repeat what Kyla and Alicia had said. She checked back to see if she had fully understood. This revoicing move isn't simple repetition, because the teacher is asking if she heard right. This allows the students to clarify their ideas so that everyone can build on their thoughts. Other talk moves help students focus on listening to what others are saying and to take responsibility for trying to understand. Who can put that into their own words? Who understood and thinks they can repeat that idea? Other talk moves help the teacher make sure that the focus stays on digging deeper into student reasoning. Why do you think that? Where do you see evidence in the data? And some talk moves actually encourage students to engage with one another's thinking and reasoning. Do you agree or disagree, and why? Who can add on to the idea that Keisha is building? What do you think of her idea? This toolkit of talk moves helps you open up the conversation so that students do the heavy lifting. The talk moves can help you support your students to clarify and formulate their own ideas so that students get to hear lots of competing ideas, even ideas that may turn out in the end not to be correct. When students discuss an incorrect idea, it often leads to a deeper understanding of the science concept. Teachers who use these moves effectively find that all students, even English language learners and those who have struggled in the past, make significant gains in learning and conceptual understanding, 
gains that show up in student writing as well as on standardized tests. All right. So wanted to have that video on external source there. And then another uh, big piece that uh, wanted to share is the checklist. And again, not a giant surprise, but one, you know, I have this just printed out and it's just in this one that again, kind of priming me to look at this. So no, no big surprises, but did want to just step back and give everyone like, maybe a, a minute to just read it, think about it, and, you know, start to, yeah, prime your brain. Where have you already been using it? Where is there a chance in what you're teaching where you might be able to insert some of these? These are small little bits, this one, uh, but talk moves. So give everyone about 60 seconds. Oh yeah. Susan's already put the link in there. So if you want to open it up yourself or you can look at this screen, 60 seconds just to scan it and think about it. And I'm just going to add on really quick, like Bradford, this is this has been out for a while. And um, I, I did the same thing. I printed this off and I just used these questions. And you can see that it can be used as in a teacher in a full class discussion but these could also be used in smaller groups with students. Um, but if you are leading discussions as a teacher, these work just as well as they do in small student groups. So about 20 seconds. Yeah, thanks, Pamela, for sharing that. And, you know, I, I know from discussions and, and you know, so giving wait time is sometimes hard because when you give wait time and then it seems like it, didn't build to something, you know, when you have that reluctant student to talk, you give this few minutes and then nothing happens from it. So, you know, this checklist, everyone, you probably know all of these things, right? So that's not, it's not a, a something new, but, uh, you know, the video showed this a little bit, that combination of sentence starters, talk moves, reflecting on it, thinking about the goals. And we got a couple, obviously the rest of today is, building up those little pieces, right? There's no silver bullet that um, this strategy is gonna get all your students talking. You know, it, that's the messy part of student talk and the complexity of being a teacher is all those little, the combination of all those little things together. Okay, so, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, ahead, one of the hardest things is this idea that if, student, if a student shares something that may not be correct is it's not, you do not want to shut them down. You want to keep the conversation going and you want through other students contributing information using data and evidence, you want that student to come around um, with the preponderance of evidence as opposed to saying you're wrong. Like that is the last thing you want to do when you have an open classroom where you want students to talk is to tell a student publicly that they are incorrect and they may never talk again if you do that. So uh, that's why these moves are so great because there's so many ways to get around that and to try to expand and clarify thinking. Um, and uh, and you know it, it's it's very powerful when you start using it. We have another video that we're going to share. And I, I think just because 
it helps to see this in action in a classroom to give us the kind of bravery to try these in our own classrooms. And this one, even though it is uh, an ELA teacher, it's the, the talk moves are all appropriate for uh, science when we do read and we do have data talks in science where these would be appropriate. But her strategy of taping these onto the desk so they're always available is a really awesome strategy. So we thought this was worth time in the webinar for you to see another example of high school students um, using talk moves in a small group, as opposed to the previous video, which was a teacher using it in a whole group. These are the keys to participating in a conversation fully. Sometimes we all need a little bit of a Kickstarter to feel like we can contribute. Children are going to struggle a bit, depending on how confident they feel in speaking up in class. And yet this teacher wants everybody in the class to feel valued. So the kids are all learning phrases that can inspire other kids to contribute more easily. We're trying to build a conversation here that is a community of caring and respect. So look at your talk moves on the table today and I have a post-it note here for you. Talk moves are essentially sentence starters that students can use to get themselves into the conversation and to draw other people into the conversation. By the government and they just can't like figure out what to do. With this I taped the talk moves right on the table so that they would be ever present in everyone's mind. Today, I want you to keep track of your talk move. Every time they used a talk move, they put a check on their sticky note. So if somebody at your table looks like they don't have a talk move check mark yet, invite them into the conversation. How could you do that? Say like, what do you think? Definitely. Would you use their name? Yeah. Awesome. Everything so, about oh, think? activating a child's cognitive skills begins with activating their social connectedness. Verbalizing and using language and working with peers creates that kind of social stimulus that drives the development of the brain. I pretty much look at the thing every single time to see if there's like something I can say, like a clarifying question. Can you explain more about like why he would get in trouble? Um, he spray painted something on his rival soccer team's um, school. When you ask a person a clarifying question, it's either, oh, I heard you said, or can you repeat what you said, or to add on to. They help enormously with language learners. They give everybody a platform to jump into a conversation because half the sentence is there for them already. But they also challenge other types of learners who may be accustomed to doing independent work and they need a bridge to collaborate more with a group. It pushes kids out of their comfort zone of social conversations and it moves them more towards a professional and an academic kind of register. All his accomplishments in his past, like all the other marches he had, like Martin Luther King, his other previous marches, and he wants to help his, his next march. I heard you say previous marches, like does it say anything about like yeah, like he was in Martin Luther King, I guess. I do talk moves because in order to have a great discussion, everyone has to feel like they're part of it and valued. And when they walk away, they really have bridged a gap with someone that maybe they wouldn't have necessarily talked to or talked to on that level. This teacher is aware of children having different levels of comfort and discomfort, of making their skills visible, and she's getting kids to support each other's participation with these talk moves. This teacher created a pathway for every single child in this class to belong. These are the keys. Okay, so we wanted to give you a chance uh, so, yep, we did a lot of priming, and here we're going to give you a moment, you know, 
some private think time in the idea capture tool and then have some time in breakout rooms. And so again, just that list. So it's more for other people's benefit. So we just kind of wanted people to see sometimes if, if talk moves when you got introduced to them or the AB sharing didn't feel right when you got introduced, introduced to it, what happens in a PLC when you see like five of your colleagues have had success with it, it uh, is encouraging to say, I should try that. So our that first one in the idea capture tool, we're hoping you'll just list a couple that have worked for you for the benefit of other people as they scan to see, hey, this is one I should check out. And then two, what is the value of using talk moves to guide class discussion? And again, that's a priming feature. We just know that writing and writing about it just sort of interconnects it. Just like we want students to write, we want you to write to interconnect this and synthesize. Maybe try to add something that doesn't roll off your tongue right away. You know, if you've already had an answer to talk moves. Try to integrate it with something you saw in the video, something you heard. And then is there a talk move you'd like to try? Again, same thing, because we're hoping that uh, uh, some of these pop up and then next week we can put you in a group that you try a similar talk move to with some other people. Uh, we want to give you some private think time to do that in the idea capture tool. Yep, awesome. Thank you, Susan, put that in there. And I'm going to flash up the idea capture tool because it might, if you, right here, Everyone, if you can find your name and uh, we had someone maybe who late registered. Yeah, perfect. You got it figured out. So you can type your name within like if someone's new and doesn't have a spot, you can grab teacher six. You'll just start right. It You want to keep the link active. That's a little bit tough, but no big deal. Anyways. Um, yeah, you can grab one of those names. We'll give you private think time and then. We're going to put them in breakout rooms with a partner four so minutes. A partner piece. Yes. How much private thing time? We didn't actually specify that. I think we're just going to keep it pretty brief. So because um, maybe a couple minutes of think time. And then um, I think we have just four minutes for the pair share. So a total of six minutes. And then we're going to come back as a whole group and have people share in the chat. So we're going to do two levels of sharing. So sharing with your pair, your partner, and then sharing with the whole group. So two minutes to be in the idea capture tool. And make sure when you go to your breakout room, you introduce yourself to your partner. Bradford, are you going to set up breakout rooms or do you want me to? I am all set, ready to go. Okay. And, uh, yep. I'll be quiet. <laughs> oh, no problem. All right, so we're about to move into breakout rooms. And a couple of people have, um, I yeah, totally understand the internet glitching. Uh, we'll see. I'm going to open it maybe. Some people that left and they came back, I'm not sure they have a room, but we'll get that figured out. And then one other thing, after the four minutes, you get 30 seconds and then it'll pull you, it'll kind of zoom pull you back. So please feel free, use that whole 30 seconds. You don't need to come back, but just know at the end of the 30 seconds, it is going to pull you back to the whole group. So hoping that 30 seconds gives you time to uh, finish the thought. And, and we do understand that some people may have their cameras off for um, personal reasons and 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 just let your partner know that you um, aren't comfortable in putting your camera on. But if you are, it would be great if you could put your camera on when you're in the pair share. Excellent, cool and uh, perfect. And if you end up, I just see that, uh, yep, I think everyone has a partner, at least one. So uh, if you have any trouble, obviously just hit that button of call in facilitator. All right, we're gonna open them. And uh, I'll see you back in four and a half minutes. They hopefully are now open for you.
donc euh... great I think is anyone having trouble let's hear I think we got everyone in our spot okay If you see any breakout rooms with just one person, like room seven doesn't have anybody. Yeah. Okay. Anybody that's alone, we need to move yeah. into another breakout room. Oh, so, no, I wouldn't. Okay, it looks like every, there's at least two and everything, but um, it looks like seven may need yes. to be moved. Good, yeah. Oh, no, and now room four is having trouble. Okay. Uh -huh. Maybe Leah needs to be moved. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I didn't know where to. I'm gonna. The early rooms have three, so yeah. Okay, and now I see. Like room 10, 11, 12 could use it. You can maybe move Leah to one of them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Room nine. I'm going to move room nine to room 10. Yeah. Oh, should we? Yeah, we could. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if we put it in the chat now, if, yeah, I, I think they probably have plenty to talk about, but maybe it's worth putting these three questions in the, with oh, the right. idea capture tool. I can't select it though, because I'm in present mode. Okay, I can do it. I can select it because I have the presentation open here. They are on the idea capture tool. Yeah. You know, but I'll put him in here anyways. Oh, let's see. There's about 30 seconds remaining. And then they'll have another 30 seconds, so we're about one minute out. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now it has the 30 second timer going. Thanks for doing the breakout rooms, Bradford. I just haven't done a lot of that. So, um, yeah, glad to. Oh, yeah. Get people back. This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Great. All right, welcome back. Okay, so goal is to um, do a little priming and have you back in groups. So welcome back. Just another thing to put in, in front of your mind that you know there's a lot of different levels of discourse and you know just connecting this uh yeah zoom is it's, it is funny to do a discourse over zoom but uh just as <laughs> this course is a little more uh harder but uh in any case we know that you know just think one of the lenses i have on this is from the student perspective is the social uh anxiety or you know what where would a student feel most comfortable starting the talk right and then also 
you know, and that's connected to exposure, practice mastery. As students feel better with ideas, they might they might be more comfortable. Now, that's only that's along the dimension of their comfort with the content, and then also there's the comfort with other people and students, and that also might follow this same progression. That you know, students probably want to talk in small groups before they share to a larger group, and then even say the whole class. And this All really right. helps our yeah, English language learners too, to be able, we're going from low stakes when we're talking about a student sharing an idea with a partner. And it's really helpful if they've had time to think about what they want to say before they say it. And often, I don't know if you noticed in the videos, but in both videos, students had their notebooks or they had their information that they were their text that they were talking from available to them to refer to. And that is really, really important that we just aren't cold calling on students. Like when I was in school and my teacher, you know, would just call um, uh, and, you know, and I didn't have the answer. And I remember being very, very embarrassed. So having that chance for the pair and that's, you know, and that we're going back and forth in the unit. We're providing all these different opportunities of speaking at, in, at different levels with different numbers of people. And maybe at times uh, for that student that starts in a pair, shares their ideas in a group, they will finally be ready to share with the whole class because they've had at least two or three or four opportunities to kind of refine their idea before they go very public. Yeah, and it, we're, I can be guilty of going on and on. So, I, but I, I do want to say because this is such a powerful move. So often is that you might orchestrate if you start in small groups and you're talking to students and they have a great idea. You know, hey, can I call on you to share to the whole class? You know that, you know that's a good Kickstarter because then you already have like three or four students that share in that whole class discussion. So that's just one in your back pocket. And of course that in a sense is a compliment to that student, right? That they have such a great idea you want them to share. So uh, that is, you know, just, a, that's a real tiny one. Okay, so let's uh, move forward though. And you saw it in the video, they talked about it. Uh, there's a fancy name for this, but uh, you know, the idea where all the discussion is going through the teacher and, yeah, that, and of course we want to really move to this one. So that's that chance. If you're, you know, we need students, uh, students need to be, uh, don't have, <laughs> I just scanned the, the research article that we were gonna say, so I'd say it the same way they said it, but we know students need repetition and practice. They need to get reps in with language and talking to the teacher one at a time, that is just, you're not going to get enough conversation and practice with language doing that. So, of course, then the question is, how do we structure that so that it's productive academic talk? Okay, let's talk about one example. And that's what's, or actually, I'm going to, Susan is going to talk about the research, and then we're going to dive into the classroom practice. Yeah, we, just, we put two links to research articles in here in case you wanted to read them, but um, there are results that show that um, the, the, there's a strong link between students, um, the, the amount of talk time they have and the number of utterances uh, or things that they say that feature reasoning. So the more students talk, the more they're engaged in the reasoning. And we know that this is a key aspect of NGSS and we want to provide those opportunities. And really it's in the center of all of the standards, the common core and NGSS is um, evidence-based reasoning. And, um, and then the other thing is, is that as students talk more, they fail less. So active classrooms where students are talking have lower failure rates than classrooms where lecture is the predominant modality of instruction. And this, they said that uh, it could be 55% less. So just wanted to throw that out there. Nice. All right, so one of a big, 
one of the uh, a really nice move that you'll see in the curriculum all three years critically articulated is the driving question board. And if you're unfamiliar with that, of course, we'll give a quick introduction, but want to just put out there that even it, it gives back at all levels. As students gets better, which we might not even see in ninth grade, I teach ninth grade. So I'm hoping that in 10th grade and 11th grade, they get even better at it. But uh, even in ninth grade, even the first one that they do, it's clunky, but uh, it already has some positive benefits. And then the second, third, fourth one, they get better and better. So know some of these things do take time to get good at, and they're so important that they really are in the whole sequence, three years of it. So this is one that we strongly encourage coming back to again and again. And if you are teaching the second or third year of high school science, hoping that uh, you see students grow in that dimension. Okay, so. Yeah, and really there's many middle school curriculums where driving question boards are integral to them and so, um, if you have a, a middle school that where students are doing that, that's feeding into your high school, they may come in to high school knowing what a driving question board is. But a driving question board is this great tool that um, does promote equity in the classroom because we are valuing the ideas and questions that every student has. And then they feel that the instruction has been personalized to their own questions. So students are naturally curious about the world, especially if we're presenting them with phenomenon um, that, that they are connected to and want to explain. Um, we want every student's question to be part of the driving question board and ho hopefully even more than one question. And um, I think Bradford will talk to this a little bit more. Many teachers um, shy away from using this because they're afraid that students will ask questions that they do not really intend to, to answer in the curriculum. And we cannot let that fear of that uh, question that may be an outlier um, undermine the value of that most student questions will actually be what you already were going to talk talk about and teach. So um, it's nice if these are able to stay in the classroom. We realize that that is not always practical and that we do have shared classrooms. These can be done virtually. It's really ideal if these question boards, driving question boards are referred to again and again as we're doing lessons and we're saying, ah, oh, we answered this question, we've answered this question, we're answering your questions, like you had these questions and we're answering them. So science is like important. Um, it's, it's, it's answering your questions about the world. So this is a very, very valuable tool for student engagement. And we're gonna go to the next slide, which is just an example of a question that might be one that it, that you would find in middle school, to be honest, this is a middle school question. And um, in a, it was my own experience of sitting on Cannon Beach, um, looking at the sun setting over the Western ocean and seeing the, the setting sun, a crescent moon, Venus and Jupiter at the same time. And we know that Venus is closer to the sun than the earth and Jupiter is further from the sun than the earth. And it's like, how could I see this all at the same time. And, and in middle school, we have students then try to make a model of how that would work and, um, and then generate questions that they would have that then if, go and become the entire unit that uh, we then teach on space. Nice. So Bradford had a few points yeah. in the next slides. Yeah, excellent. and and we've iterated some of the structures to help students, uh, yeah, just the facilitation. So here, driving question board, uh, and, and not so much as a problem, but to generate, one of the things we want the driving question board to do is cue up and get students thinking about what they're gonna learn, right? When they have the tree, it's easier to hang their knowledge on it. 
So we want driving question boards to anticipate the learning that's coming. They're, they're not going to know the answer, but if they know the question, then the arc of the learning progression makes sense to them. And the more that makes sense, the more that frees up their mind to wrestle with the the skills that they're working on, the, the talk that they're doing, uh, the content that they're wrestling with. So in any case, this is an iterated version of the driving question board that we found really gets that to happen more often. And it's not perfect. And one other piece that I wanted to throw in from, a, from those previous slides is, it's really nice if you are able to save these, you know, you put them on poster paper usually, and then each period has one. Uh, it's really nice occasionally, you know, you got five extra minutes at the end of class, you go walk over and see which questions have we answered. And that's a nice thing to do, you know, at some point at the end of the unit, I mean, mid unit, it does any, I just wanted to say it's very flexible. So if you have a couple minutes, you want a brain break, um, have students walk over there and see if they could answer one. All right. So with that, here is this structure though, you know, and it's nothing surprising. And, you know, so many of talk moves is not about surprising. It's about finding that right mix that's going to work for the students in front of you. But, uh, you know, what do scientists or engineers need to know, investigate and model? You know, that's a big one. Uh, yeah. Just in there, we mean mathematically model or, uh, pictorially model to understand this phenomena, or if it's an engineering project, solve the problem. And just so it's clear, each student, we really do want every student generating some sticky notes. And sometimes they might repeat the same thing over and over. So that number two is aimed at trying to do that. So they, as they write their note, they share it with their group. And so within the table group before, you shouldn't have ideally have repeats. They could be clustered similar, and that's great. And that tells you usually if they're clustering, that's because they're probably onto something major in the learning arc. And then three, once a response is shared, create a new unique one. So I guess two and three are aimed at not having too many repeats within a group. Of course, across groups, there's going to be repeats, but that's probably because students are focused on something that's key and really important. And then that fourth one really is meant to open it up. So, you know, these first three sticky notes, maybe it's two, maybe it's three, are on what do scientists and engineers need to know, investigate, and model to understand it. And then we do want that wonder. And that's a really great thing. And so we save the last sticky note for what's something that didn't quite fit into this that you wonder about. All right, with that, and then again, sometimes it is, uh, this is that second piece. As they start bringing those sticky notes up, and I'm so tempted to talk about a particular example from my own classroom, but I know we had, we wanted to have some prepared ones. So I'm gonna hand it back to Susan in just a second, but I'll just say, here's those sentence starters. As you start having students share those post-it notes, we really want them to build on each other's ideas. You know, goal number four, from the beginning of this webinar. So they, here's some sentence starters about connecting, uh, presenting and connecting. And sometimes after you kind of play, it's a wonderful thing that, hey, anyone else have a connection? And sometimes you, if it's a really big, important thing, you would see e each group would have someone coming up to put a post-it note. And that's a powerful statement, right? When, if you have 10 groups, 10 people come up and put a post-it note there. Ding, ding, ding. This is key that we're doing. And then after you play that out, though, you're going to present a new idea. So that's part three. And Susan's going to share a couple examples. So the example that's on this slide here is that, that, um, that first middle school example that I was talking about where students generated questions um, about how can I see a setting sun, a crescent moon, Jupiter and Venus at the same time. And they did a, a modeling experiment or a, a initial model building. And, um, and then they had these questions and it ended up that 
there were um, five categories that all questions fit in. And then there was this one question here that didn't fit in any of the categories. And that will happen, but that can't stop you from doing this is um, and these type of areas here. Does light have anything to do with how we see the planets, how do planets move, et cetera? And the, the, the most powerful thing with the protocol that Bradford just said is that it is so much more powerful when the students make the connections. So every question there is either going to be related to a question that's already there, or it's a completely new question. So for example, in this first category, all the questions that had to do about light and how we see the planets would go in that category. And if it was a question about how planets moved, well, then a student that would be presenting that would say, well, this is a new idea. My question isn't about light, it's about planets moving. So you start a new category. And it ends up that um, the students are categorizing them. That is way more valuable than the teacher categorizing the questions for the student. Uh, and I think the next slide has a couple more um, just example, just visual examples. And you can see just grouping them, um, circling them, doing it on butcher paper, doing it on whiteboards, doing it on um, other kinds of paper is a really, uh, you know, is, is how it's done this. And you can do it virtually. So we did do this in a, a webinar last year for student talk and on the next slide. And this is from the, by the chemistry one, unit one, where we have a driving question board. And the question is, um, the, the phenomenon is differences in atmospheric gas, temperatures, snowpack and seawater are causing changes to local and global weather patterns. So we're going to have you, um, Go. We have two breakout rooms because we have a large number of people here. We didn't feel we could do it all in one breakout room. So Bradford's going to be in one. I'm going to be in the other. And we're going to practice generating questions to this, uh, this kind of phenomenon, uh, climate change that introduces the chemistry unit one. So sorry, the... the so if you're in breakout room one, you'll be in Jamboard one. And if you're in breakout room two, you'll be in Jam room Jamboard two. And we're just gonna practice making the questions. And I'm just gonna say that as you're writing your questions and you're seeing questions that are similar or different, you can start that categorization if you want to and feel up to it. But um, uh, we, we may not practice that protocol here today exactly as it is, but. That's great. And uh, Leah, I don't, I saw your hand and I had no idea how long that might've been up. Just want to do a quick check-in. Did, did you have something to share? Um, yeah, thank you. I guess I um, am really curious about how, to facilitate getting the kids to come up with the categories. I don't yeah. really get when that happens. If you go back to slide 25, um, mm -hmm. that the next one, oh, 25 is, yeah. Oh, no. yeah. It, Sorry, uh, so, yeah. one more. There. <laughs> I got okay. one more. <laughs> oh, back one more, yes. Good. The protocol, we need the protocol. There oh, we go. Okay. Presenting a new idea. So when students present it, so every student presents a question and there's three sentence frames for that. And then as they're growing up, they're saying what their idea is. Then they say, they either connect it to a new idea and then, and they put it with a group that's already up there. Or if it's completely different in their mind, we have a different idea and they start a new category. Now, whether they name the categories you know, that's something that probably is a teacher facilitated discussion. Like that would be like, what do these questions all have? And similar, then you could say the kids probably have some ideas and you could put that up. Do we agree or disagree? Is there somebody have a different idea? Um, and we all agree that, that how planets move is different than uh, how we see planets. Okay. We've got a new idea going planet movement. So that it's just part of the process 
the teacher may have to facilitate naming the categories. And if a, a child has a problem um, with that, then there might be some talk move facilitation. Yes. So the kids are going up to the to the big piece of paper with their question and kind of looking at the other post-its that have already been posted and thinking, oh, mine goes with this. Yeah. That makes sense. And then Bradford was saying he uses a talk move of saying, and does any do I, any other students have a question that's connected to this one? And then then you can get like 10 mm -hmm. kids coming up oh, yeah. all at once. <clears throat> And, and we're about to do one example. So we're, you're going to get introduced to a phenomena and then you're going to make a drive. You're going to do a couple post-it notes virtually in that breakout room. And that's in there. So we're about to do it. Um, we're going to practice a little bit. Yep. And, but to prime it and, and Susan encouraged me to share examples. So I, I will there, uh, you know, this one is from uh, physics where they, they watch a video of a bungee jumper. And then we ask that question. I will, I'll go back to the question. Like, whoops. Oh, sorry. What do we as scientists or engineers need to know, investigate, and model to understand how to be uh, have a successful bungee jump? And they're going to ask questions like, how stretchy is the cord? And, oh, it depends on how high the jumper is to start. And so we actually end up kind of sketch, they have so many things that we need a drawing. And then they even kind of put like, what are the things we need to know when, when the jumper's up high? And they start to put that there. So, and if you look at all the sticky notes, it traces out the learning progression. Not always, they don't do it in the same order because it's not really in that order, but that might help, but it might not because I'm not showing the sticky notes that students come up with. So we have one that we have examples of sticky notes. So that's why we're going to shift to the chemistry examples so that we show things from physics, chemistry, and biology. So we're about to start that. I'm not sure if that helped or hurt, but uh, I do want to get us going on the, act, the joint activity. So hopefully you have the uh, breakout room open and I'll just show that. So like Half of you roughly should be here. You don't know which one you're in yet because I'm going to open the breakout rooms in just a second. And then the other half is at that other one. Okay, with that, I'm going to get to the right slide. You are being asked, and maybe we should copy this question. Susan, if you're able, differences in atmospheric gas, temperatures, snowpack, and seawater are causing changes to local and global weather patterns. That's something that they... Oh yeah, go ahead. You take it. That, that question is on the jam boards um, that when we go to the breakout rooms. Okay. I'm ready with when are we ready for the breakout rooms? Um, I did not. I'm sorry. I didn't I, I made the breakout rooms. I didn't know if oh, you were yeah, ready. I think we're ready. Mm-hmm. Because okay. you and I are so, gonna be in them, so we'll be able to help people along. Yeah. Okay, so we will meet you in the breakout rooms and they are open now. Oh, and I got a couple of people that are unassigned. So let me uh, try to get you in the right. Am I in one or two, Bradford? You are, un you, oh yeah. Uh, why don't you take one and I'll take two. Okay.
So I can't, oh, there it is. Well, that was very quick. <laughs> we, we just a time we, check. It's five twenty, Susan. Yeah, just I knew it was going to be quick. So let's. So we did this exercise with um, the previous group, and and I on on this next slide, twenty nine here. Um, we did um, have questions that these are questions that the previous teacher group did um, generate. And then Bradford, if you go to the next slides, we were able to categorize every single question in to the five task sets, everyone fit. Um, and there was a lot of questions about sea level rise in that group. If we go to the next slide, there were few questions that came up about shellfish and um, there is that potential if there was like a lot of interest in the um, acidification of the ocean as a result of this and the um, kind of dissolving of sea uh, fish shells, which is actually a phenomenon that's happening uh, in Wallapa Bay um, and endangering the oyster populations there in um, southwest uh, Washington. Um, but students we do have a project that students can address their, in their own research projects. Those questions could be answered and captured there um, for students as well, but it also shows up in the unit and chemical reactions later. 
So um, we, our group didn't get really a chance to do much of the characterization, but we, we wanted to just calm your fears that there really is a question that can, will not fall somewhere in the unit. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is fun. And again, just to say, if there is one that's outside that scope, usually that's a, a compelling question. And it doesn't always have to be the teacher asked them, right? Like people had that old strategy of like, when there's a question you can't answer, that's a perfect time to have a student research it and find it. And so you have that time scale. And of course, that might even be something that is a sign that maybe it should, you might want to include it in the learning. All right, we do, I think, need to make an adjustment. Um, we don't want to rush the data discussion. No. There is some new tools that we have because it's data discussions are like one of the most important things. And they're also one of the hardest things. And students also are sometimes most reluctant about data discussions because it's not as, you know, it, it they're not as comfortable with it. So we, I think the right move, the kind of on our feet move is to save that one for next time. Right. And, and Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was saying that continuing the conversation is also a data discussion that, um, so we could save both of those. I don't know if we want to go to the AB partner talk. Yeah. If we have, yeah, that's one. And we'll just do the data discussions and other new protocols um, on November 15th. Yeah. But you do have the slideshow. So if you want to preview them, they would be there. Yes, excellent. Please do. And all right, so to give, and we want to give a little bit of time for reflection here. So I think we're down to like yes. just three minutes. Just want to show this. So here is some AB talk shares and nothing magical. I want to say one of the best things is to what we've already said, the person, if you, there's a placemat and this, everyone has access to this in the zero posters, which chemistry and biology have um, linked on the teacher calendar. But let me just show these because you have this slide deck. So you can use this slide deck to get to them as well. But many minds, one marker, it just really clarifies who is writing on the whiteboard and uh, what is being talked about. Nothing magical about this. And I'll say one last thing that sometimes there's in a group, there's someone who likes to follow the rules. And it's really nice because if they are the third person to share, they then it they use positive peer pressure to have student one and two go. So it becomes their turn to share. That is something I've seen over and over. And so, you know, it's this, these protocols are so specific that they feel awkward, but they also make it so that students know the flow. And so I I'm probably not giving you enough time, especially because I'm talking while I'm showing the slides. I just want to pique your interest and see, maybe you want to try one of these. Uh, you know, is there a listen and compare? And these are really meant to be generic enough that you could uh, throw that in. And again, just so you know, why is it A, B and color coding? Because A, B allows pairs, A's with B's, or you can have a big uh, group of four and then you switch to color. So A, B, there's nothing magical about A and B other than the first two letters. And it's an easy way to pair people up. Someone already talked about like clock partners, which is just an easy way to have students have possibly up to 12 or 11 different partners to connect with. All right. Um, I will just revoice and compare. Stronger, clear is one of the best. And that's woven into all three courses. That's usually around something really substantial where students practice again and again. And they're always a little reluctant, usually because it is something substantial, but there's a good vibe after the end. Over and over, we've seen it with teachers too, that even teachers in the work, summer workshops and, and school year workshops, you get that kick that if you do it three times in a row, it's a little repetitive, but you actually get better. And there is that little bit of spark of joy of just like, yeah, I really did get pretty good by the end. All right, with that, there was one, the thing that these lack, except for this one, is these don't have the sentence stems. They say what, how the structure of the conversation should go. So I'll turn it over here to Susan to mention this protocol and then share just a little bit about AB sharing before we start to wrap up. 
Yeah, and I, and I don't know, Bradford, if you could go to that link there, um, just so we can show what it is. Or no, yeah. The, the link in the slide. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. So this just, this is a way, this is used in middle school and um, it can be used in high school that it shows the sentence frames for A and B and you can, it's the same as the talk moves and the talk move checklist. We just make a copy of it and give it to students um, and have them use it. And the idea is that then you reverse. So partner A starts uh, with A and then B, A, B, and then you reverse. So whoever was partner A then becomes B and um, they do it again. So they do it twice. So they have chances to do both roles and it's super effective um, and can really help a student clarify their thinking. It's and it's very specific. Um, it can be done to phenomenon. It's really good. To, we were going to have you do it with a video. Um, uh, it can be done for a number of different kinds of activities. It's very specific about explaining your reasoning and it's, it's kind of geared to science. So um, I think um, I think that's all we, I think maybe some of these we might come back to and do a little bit more detail next week. Um, and if you do, if anyone gives AB partner protocol a shot, we'd love to hear from you um, on the 15th. So Bradford, maybe we can go to our final slides here. Yeah. And, oh yeah, I'm on the wrong, uh, I had multiple screens open. So uh, good. Yes, and I'll say uh, that just, uh, oh, one vision that we have since we do do common enough things is to actually start to make each, like the driving question board, when you're doing that particular one on climate change, that we have a task specific sentence stems. You know, sometimes they're so generic, it's a little bit hard to make it work for the task. So you can just imagine that if we had sentence stems, like I think uh, I was trying to remember the ones, you know, sea, sea level rise and atmospheric pressure. And I'm, we're, I'm also thinking we got to wrap this up. So I'm going to cut myself off, but just know that that is a project for us. And if people want to get involved to make customized sentence stems, which we can only do when we share the workload. That's just so much work that an individual teacher can't do. All right. In this last moment, I think we actually need to turn this to a waterfall. We really do want to end on time. All right. If you are willing to say, and you might not know. So if you're willing, though, can you share one talk move that you might try in the next two weeks? That's going to help Susan and I know. Um, and then it's also just going to be kind of neat to see for other people, what is a talk move that you would like to try in the next two weeks? And knowing that you'll get a chance to talk to other teachers who tried a similar move in next week. And then we'll also do a data discussion. And there's a couple other things, but the goal really is to have you um, problem solve with each other in session two. And as people are doing that, I did put in, I am going to put in an attendance um, link to attendance. And this is just for a Google form so that we can make sure that people who are here get paid if you're from Oregon, because we do, we do have grant funding to pay teachers who attend $50 an hour. We don't have access to the form. When you click on it, it says you don't have oh, access. Oh, so sorry. I thought I fixed that. Okay, I will do that. Great. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, something I always do that I hope to bring to the, this larger group is uh, we just, if you're willing to unmute, you don't have to just unmute and we'll do a countdown. And if you're just willing to say bye, and maybe if you're on video, you can just uh, wave a hand. Great, this is awesome. So glad to bring teachers together, get you paid. And it really does take us working together to serve students on the challenging task of student talk. So if you are willing, we'll do the countdown and then we'll see you in two weeks. So if you're willing, unmute three, two,
everyone. Bye. 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 And Thank don't, you. don't worry Bye. if the Google form does not work. We did take attendance. Um, we did have a member of the Portland Metro STEM partnership here taking attendance. So you are you are good. You will get paid. It has been taken. We were trying a new thing with the Google form and clearly it didn't work. So I'm glad we already took attendance another way. So great. See you next week. And if anyone has a, a question right now, that's we're we're planning to hang out for a couple of minutes, but just wanted to be clear we're kind of officially done with that webinar so, in a couple weeks yeah i was i was 11 minutes late because i had to i couldn't find the link so i probably wasn't there for attendance ah so. okay excellent we'll, get, we'll was, make sure it was, it was we'll speaking just so i can um pamela i think yeah. is it pamela yep. yeah that i would love to definitely make questions that are pertinent because i have troubles with the kids using this this sentence frames they they're they like they can't seem to make them work. So I'll definitely keep that in mind and take bring some back. All right. Awesome. Bye. See you in a couple of weeks. See ya. Um, can I get Bye. the link to the slide deck? I switched from my phone yes. to computer. I got it right here, so I can okay, do it. Good. Thank you. Yeah. And then I'm curious, is this so this is through PDX STEM? So does the payment come as a check from yeah, portland state they, yeah from so portland that's, state that's their fiscal okay. agent and okay. it's, they only do it twice a year so they're going to be doing it in december for all the fall webinars and then they'll do it again in the spring for all it's just too much paperwork to do it after every yeah. webinar so they keep track of you know people are attending multiple webinars then they just um cut one check and, and oh, okay. just so you're aware sorry it is oftentimes delayed, so do apologize for that. But yeah. it it takes a while on the PSU. So well. The PSU. Wow. Yeah, I just um, and so it's like seventy five dollars for this webinar. Yeah, because it's an hour and a half, right? so it's yeah. fifty dollars an hour. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. For session okay. one, and then um, session. Two and then dollars. someone. Okay. And then it's just hard to know, like, I just lose track of all the things I'm doing and I forget how much I'm spending. <laughs> like, well, yay, a check came. I have no idea what it's for. But because um, <laughs> they're never itemized, right? They can't right, for yeah. some reason, like. But, um, and then the De someone asked in the chat if you're going to do another webinar for the Desmos. I'm curious about that too. I was signed up for that, but I had something come up and couldn't attend. Um, Excellent. Yeah, we had a huge attendance. So yes, yeah. I uh, there is a we have two more sessions. Um, we're trying to connect with math teachers. Anyways, uh, a repeat of session one. I was suggesting we should do because it got very positive reviews too. So some of the people sometimes yeah. you just need to hear it. it's good to to come. And so really appreciate the people that came. But really it help people so much that we might try and especially you saying that will help that happen so we might try a repeat and then there's going to be one more step where we try to bring science and math teachers together that's a little more interactive and then planning how they could possibly in their own school both show mm -hmm. students as most but uh yes those are in the works and hearing that you'd like a repeat of one because you couldn't make the first one and Brian, yeah, is and saying, I'd like to see it again too. Yeah, yeah several people, even people that went to the first one, yeah. said they want to come back to the repeat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. So we will, that'll be in the newsletters that go out for physics, chemistry, and biology. And then I think, yeah. I don't know, you know, PMSP or sometimes a district, you know, Andrea Leach will probably send out like a email to reminders. So that will, be there. Okay. Um, sorry to sort of hog the stage, but I just wanted to ask one more question about the card sort. I'm just looking at slide 36 um, from the slide deck for today. There's uh, exploring the pattern card sort. 
Yeah. Um, and I overheard Scott Barantine from Franklin talking about that card sort when I was at an equitable grading um, PD. Yeah. And I had him share something with me. It doesn't, I don't think it was this one. It was a different card sort, but I teach chemistry yeah. and I was sort of like, I want to do this with my students. And so oh, love it. it's not, I I'm not aware that there are any card sorts with patterns in the chemistry curriculum. Susan, is that true? Um, I um, don't know. I would I would have to, um, gosh, I was thinking that we had one in the summer um, webinar, Bradford, I mean, the summer workshop. I, I thought I remembered that we did a card sort for the gas laws, but did, did we? Oh. Uh, uh, we didn't, but... Uh, just because I have a little bit of time, I am working with the chemistry teachers to make those. So we are making oh. those right now. And uh, oh, good. Yes. And yep. And uh, the hope is by summer, we would have them for each lab. And the first oh, lab okay. that might have it, we don't try to make changes during the year, but this is just an addition that's pretty easy for a teacher yeah. if they want to grab it and use it. So there was some question about when to push it out. Um, and we actually have a meeting this uh, Thursday to talk about it. So okay. you might see those. And if you uh, are willing you know, to, to try them out, sounds like you want to, and then give some feedback on improving them. Yeah. You've you kind of got to dial the right cards and the right numbers on them and stuff like that. And then also it's always good to just, you know, teachers need to hear from other teachers that it's a good thing. And then yeah. it's like, okay, yeah, I'll try that too. Yeah. Yeah. So how would I know that they're I would, available for yeah. practice? Your meeting Thursday? Yeah, I would say Did send an email, email to Andrea Leach, letting her know that you okay. are willing to try those out. Okay. Um, and then I actually created my own just for um, some densities of gases, oh. not the gas laws. So I'm going to share those with Andrea and maybe she can take them. Are you meeting with the chemistry council on Thursday? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll share those with her and just sort of get her feedback on that too and see. Um, oh, that's awesome. So. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you yeah. so much for your time. Appreciate it, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Bye. Okie doke. Well, okay. Ambitious, but yes, I know that was. I saw that. I I I saw it happening because it it just takes a while to. Yeah, we couldn't have rushed yeah. that to fit in the data discussion. No, we laid the foundation today, so that's basically what we needed to do. And we got some people that really wrote a lot, and others who didn't write as much, but it, it'll be interesting to read through that before next time. And yeah. we'll get a planning meeting for part two going. I think it's two weeks because it's November. Yeah, it's 15th. two weeks, two weeks, yeah. yeah. Do we, so, we don't have, there's like a whole host of things for us to talk about, but in terms yeah. of just this, do we want to find a time to debrief this and- Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm totally, I have a lot of time on my schedule right now because somehow being gone for two weeks, I, I guess I just don't have the meeting load that I had before. Oh. So um, oh, it's good. It's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> what could, what about, um, oh, I might, yeah, yeah, I am a, I am a little more constrained, but Friday right, that's what afternoon. I thought. Friday at noon. No, Friday afternoon. So Friday afternoon, I'm open all Friday afternoon. So oh, yeah. pick the time that you set the meeting, whatever. Yeah, I'll set the set, meeting I'll and send there. you an invite. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I'll do that two to three. Okay, sounds good. I love okay. working with you, Bradford. It was great. Yeah, likewise. So, pleasure. Okay. All <laughs> right, see you Friday. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.